Okay, so how are steroids made? We talked last week about how peptides are made. They are made uh, through protein synthesis, usually extruded into the ER and packaged and secreted through secretory vesicles. But steroids are a different <laughs> sort of thing. They are usually produced in the vicinity of mitochondria and the smooth ER. And how that works is that the, oh, right, is that there are enzymes in the membranes of the mitochondria and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum that convert cholesterol into different kinds of steroids. Sometimes the mitochondria themselves can create a finished steroid hormone. Often what happens though is the enzymes necessary to finish the steroid hormone are actually on the smooth ER. So they actually, the intermediates actually move back and forth between these two organelles in order to get finished. And this simply shows you the whole schmear where the stimulating hormone binds to the receptor, activates a G protein, activates a denylate cyclase, which then creates a higher concentration of cyclic AMP. Remember, cyclic AMP is a really important second messenger, which then activates protein kinase A, which then causes a, a series of events leading to the freeing up of cholesterol from the lipid droplet and allowing the enzymes in these two membrane-bound compartments to make the steroid. Once the steroid is made, it doesn't hang around. It does not have to be stored in vesicles. Why not? Say again? It's lipid-soluble. Perfect. Yes, it's very greasy because of that cholesterol backbone, it slips right through the bilayer. So usually what happens is as soon as it's made, it's out of the cell. You do not need to know the names of the enzymes. Please don't memorize them. I just showed them to you so <coughs> you could get a sense of I showed you that slide to get a sense of how things were made. I was talking with Mike just a minute ago about how you guys are getting the very Reader's Digest condensed version of endocrinology. You can take whole semesters of endocrinology. You can spend four weeks on the formation of thyroxin alone. But this is a, a survey course and we can only do just a tiny bit. This picture First of all, do not copy this down. <coughs> do not memorize this. I'm putting it up there so you can see the complexity of steroidogenesis. So here we're starting with cholesterol, and each of these arrows represents an enzyme. And you'll notice that one of the first precursors, or first uh, compounds formed is progesterone, which is found a lot in pregnant ladies, but also found in um, folks who aren't. And it is converted into various compounds. Now I wanted to point up the fact that testosterone is converted into estradiol, the most ubiquitous form of estrogen. So women, you make testosterone continually um, and you convert it into estrogen. That's also looking at this, this pathway. If we have 17 alpha hydroxy progesterone, we can make cortisol or we can make the androgen that is a precursor to testosterone. But if we are missing the enzyme to make cortisol, so this arrow is missing, we can't make any of this. What happens to the concentration of the 17 alpha hydroxy progesterone? Do, do levels go up, stay the same, go down? Yes, David, and why? Because it's not being synthesized with something else. It's not being converted into cortisol, so we'll have more of this hanging around as, as progesterone is converted into this hydroxy progesterone. So what's going to happen to that? What, what you learn in basic chemistry 1A? 
when you have a, a reactant increasing in concentration, which way does it drive the equation? Toward the product. Well, this product we can't make, so it'll have to make this androgen, which means we can make more testosterone. So this is actually what happens in a genetic, uh, or not a genetic disease, it's actually, well, it is kind of genetically based, but what happens is if you have a female embryo gestating and this pathway is missing, too much testosterone will be made in that child and the child will be kind of in between male and female when it comes out as external genitalia will be confused. And that's because there would be so much testosterone made. Not enough to make a boy, but enough to virilize the female parts. I think that's interesting. Don't you think that's interesting? Okay, here's an example of what's going on with the production of hormone and the way it immediately diffuses out. This is from Rosen Flanzer. It's not in your book, so don't worry about the number. What happens is the lipoproteins are either in the membrane or they the um, materials, the cholesterol diffuses through the membrane, or this is something that happens. You have receptors on most cell plasma membranes, and these are lipoprotein receptors, and they bind to lipoproteins that contain protein and cholesterol. They are endocytosed, and they create a pool of cholesterol, which then is enzymatically converted into available cholesterol, which can be made into precursors to steroid hormones that are made by this particular cell, which is the adrenal cortex, not important now. It will be to you someday, but not right this minute. And then it will diffuse immediately out of the cell because it's greasy. Like you said, it's lipid soluble. So now that we're talking about the adrenal glands, let's figure out where they are. Adrenal, they live on top of the kidneys. So here, here are the kidneys, and I'm going to color them blue. Well, it doesn't really show up there in the nosebleed seats. So um, the adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys, sort of like a little hat. And the adrenal glands actually have structure. They have the cortex, which is the outer layer, and the medulla, which is the inner layer. You'll hear those words a lot in this course. So now that we're talking about the adrenals, we're also going to talk about that structure. Once again, the medulla, which in this picture, oh, this is 11.5. The, the blue is the medulla, which is kind of neural in its nature. The cortex is glandular, and these cells are the ones that make cortisol and cortisone and also some androgens. They will also make uh, diepiandrostinodione and, and um, even testosterone. But the outer layer of the cortex makes probably the most important hormone you can ever make. It's absolutely necessary for survival, and it's called aldosterone. And I've told you about mineralocorticoids. That, this is it. Because what it does is it influences the kidneys and tells the kidneys to save salt and not let salt go away. And um, it helps the kidneys save salt and water. It helps regulate the blood pressure. But don't write all that down because we'll talk about it in more detail when we talk about the kidneys. So aldosterone is made in this outer layer of the cortex called the zona glomerulosa. And then we have the zona fasciculata where the cortisols and androgens are made. And the reason they produce different products is because aldosterone is actually made from compounds that are made by fasciculata, the enzyme proportions are different. So you have none of the enzymes for making cortisol and androgens up here, but you have 
enzymes for converting to aldosterone, whereas these don't have enzymes to convert to aldosterone. And this is just a simplified version of that big one I showed you with all the the uh, formulae on it. And this this is 14B, one, oh, I'm sorry, 114B in your book. And this shows you hormone production in the adrenal glands. You see you can make corticosterone, aldosterone, cortisol, dehydroepiandrosterone, and at androstenedion. Now, mm, what did I want to mention? Oh yeah, where's aldosterone made again? Zona glomerulus, good. And uh, corticosterone and cortisol in also the cortex. Yes, those are both the the part of the cortex called fasciculata, right? Um, just. So I can use this word and not have to explain it every time. Cortisol and corticosterone and um, cortisol, did I mention cortisol? I did. Are examples of glucocorticoids. So glucocorticoids are most of the hormones, most of the steroid hormones made by the adrenal cortex. And aldosterone is not a glucocorticoid. It's a mineralocorticoid. Just so I can use those terms and you don't get confused. And this is just a summary slide from your book, this is 1118, and this shows control of cortisol secretion from the adrenal cortex. The hypothalamus, which is part of what organ? Anatomy folks, where do we find the hypothalamus? In the brain, thank you. And the, it, it makes a compound called CRH. And what CRH does, I'm sorry, ACTH, no, yeah, right. And then the CRH, it, it tells the pituitary to make ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. Now, why is that important? Is ACTH important? It's very important. And what it does is it causes the adrenal cortex to make cortisol. Cortisol is also important. If you take a drug called prednisone, is this one anybody's heard of? Yeah. yeah. Very common. Prednisone is given for autoimmune diseases. It's give, if you get a rash from poison oak, they'll give you prednisone. And then what they'll do, I don't know if any of you have had prednisone, but they will taper you off. It's, it's a very strong drug because it's, it's what it is, an artificial glucocorticoid. And the glucocorticoids actually repress your immune response. And if you take too much for too long, you can actually make your adrenal glands refractory. That means they don't respond to ACTH. So you don't want to take that too long and you don't want to take too much of it because you want to have this control. And look what happens at the bottom. When the cortex makes cortisol, then it feeds back not only on the hypothalamus, but it also feeds back on the pituitary. So you don't have CRH being made as much and ACTH being made as much as we have increases of concentration of cortisol in the blood. This is a very important mechanism. This is a good example of uh, negative feedback, which is a what kind of mechanism? Homeostatic. Yeah, I know you guys. I know a lot of people say, God, I hate it when she does that. It's so. But I do it because for a reason, and it also is to keep you awake. 
I was telling my genetics class this morning, good thing this genetics class isn't in the afternoon because you all get sleepy about two or three o'clock, right? You know, in civilized countries, they have a time when restaurants close, the shops close, you don't have classes, and everybody takes a nap. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, this is from Not Vander. And, <laughs> okay, would you see? No, I'm not going to ask you to memorize this. I just put this down so you could see some of the effects of stimulating the adrenal glands. Now, on the left, there, what's going on is it's stimulating the medulla. And remember, I said it was kind of neural in nature. What it makes epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are actually neurotransmitters. And we don't need to worry about that right now. But over here, through the pituitary, we have hypothalamus, pituitary, ACTH, adrenal uh, cortex making glucocorticoids and aldosterone. And what the aldosterone does is it increases retention of sodium by the kidneys, which then increases the amount of water retained by the kidneys because water follows sodium. Remember, we had that little thing that we talked about before? And the glucocorticoids will change the speed at which proteins and fats can be converted into glucose. And the reason for that is, guess who needs glucose and can't use fats or proteins? Neural tissue, central nervous system needs to have glucose. Um, also, it could suppress the immune system. So don't be stressed, because the more you allow yourself to experience low-level stress, the more likely you're going to get colds and other illnesses. And I'll tell you something. When I taught, when I taught high school, I got a cold every month. And it wasn't just stress, but because they were bringing me the bugs. But when I stopped teaching high school and went back to get my doctorate, I went down to zero colds a year. So stress can really influence your health. Don't do stress. I know some of you are stress monkeys. Don't do it. Give it up. Learn to breathe. Oh, I haven't done the deep breathing exercise, Michael. Uh oh. He, what, what was that look? Oh. <laughs> I look like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Just lean back in your seats. Don't <coughs> fall asleep. You may close your eyes. Take a deep breath and hold it. And now let it out quietly. Take another deep breath and hold it. Slowly let it out. One more time, breathe in, hold it, hold it, slowly breathe out. This is the beginning of an activity where you can actually send yourself messages. Messages like, I'm not going to be stressed out when I see a series of numbers. I'm not going to be stressed out when I hear someone say the word midterm. I'm not going to get stressed out when I see a mid. You, you, can, you can actually imagine yourself in a wonderful, relaxing space and give yourself these messages while deep breathing. And all you have to do when you're in a stressful situation, you can feel your muscles bunching up and your, your heartbeat going up. Just deep breathe and it'll just take you back to that nice, relaxed feeling. And that's important because you can learn better, you can think better, you can perform better when you're relaxed. This is not goofy stuff. They've actually done science and found it to be true. It's not just Berkeley, okay? It's real. And I don't know if you remember the, the swim teams, the Olympic swim teams, I think they first started doing it in Barcelona in the games there where they, they showed the swimmers going through this relaxation Exercise, relaxation and numetry. Picture they'd stand on that you know, the the dive platform a million miles above the stadium and they'd just be sitting there. You could see them taking deep breaths and they wouldn't dive. They'd just stand there and they were doing that relaxation. 
and then they'd do a, a triple flip with a half gainer and a wazoo, and they'd hit the water perfectly because they were so relaxed. They didn't let the pressure get to them. you got to relax. Because not only do you perform better when you're relaxed, your immune system is more effective when you allow yourself to relax. I used to have a graduate student colleague who was very tense, and he had coffee all the time. He, he had coffee brewing in the lab. And I said, you know, maybe you, sh you don't need the coffee. And he said, my tension and the coffee are what keep me up together. <laughs> so don't be tense, and don't overdo coffee. Is there a question, dear? I heard, um, I wonder if you can clarify this. I heard that frequent sex also is good for you. Oh, yes. Frequent sex, really good for you. Yes. Nothing like the sleep of the just after. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, we're going to get to digestion, but I just heard that this guy broke the record by 53 and 3 quarters hot dogs. That's got to be bad for you. Right? 53 and 3 quarter hot dogs sounds like a cholesterol nightmare to me. Be bad. I think it's bad for you, <laughs> especially in one sitting. How does that have to do with relaxation? <laughs> you just have to have a really relaxed throat to do that, I guess. Ew. Well, anyway, don't eat 53 hot dogs in one sitting, and try not to be stressed out. Easier said than done, but if you do this, and there's a longer, I have a 15-minute exercise. I used to do it with my, my um, students in the high school, and they, they would come in sometimes and say, we going to meditate today? It's not meditation. We're just relaxing. But it, it is good for you. So try to relax sometime during the day, even if, it, if all that involves is, is going for a, a two-mile run. That's another good way to relax. OK, so we've talked about how steroids are made. We gave an example of one place where steroids are made, the adrenals. Where else are steroids made? I heard somebody whisper it. It starts with a G. Gonads. The gonads. Sex. The sex glands. The, the testes and the ovaries. So the adrenals and the sex glands are where steroids are made. Not the brain. I read an article in a local magazine a couple of days ago where he's talking about when you fall in love, the brain floods the body with steroids and testosterone and androgens. Now I was saying, well, okay, testosterone is an androgen. It's also a steroid, so all he needed to say was steroids. And the brain doesn't make them. Okay, the brain doesn't make steroids. Okay, repeat, the brain does not make steroids. Okay, steroid action. Unlike, remember the peptide hormones landed on cell membrane receptors and the signal was transduced through the membrane through second messengers and G proteins and all that good stuff? Steroid hormones used to be thought the only steroid receptor would be found inside the cell because the hormone can diffuse right through the bilayer and get into the cell. And some steroid receptors lived in the cytoplasm and when bound by the steroid hormone would migrate into the nucleus and dock on a special place in the DNA where it would instigate transcription of a particular gene. Or sometimes the steroid hormones live in the nucleus and they get bound by steroid hormone receptors live in the nucleus, the hormone binds to them in the nucleus, then they dock on the DNA. Or the receptor actually is docked on the DNA, and all it needs to do is bind to the receptor, the steroid hormone binds to the receptor to activate it, and that causes DNA uh, transcription. So what happens is the hormone comes in through the membrane, binds to a cytoplasmic receptor that migrates or goes right into the nucleus, binds to a receptor that is already there, and then causes transcription of a particular gene. So the mRNA can be used to make a particular protein. But they've also found out that some cells 
actually have a steroid receptor on the surface of the cell. And that allows the cell to have a more rapid response to the steroid because steroids typically take a long time for their effect to be felt. Because you have to transcribe mRNA from the DNA and then go through translation and post-translational processing and packaging, it's, it's a very lengthy process. It's not like, whoosh, we're filling the cell with calcium in an instant, as you would with some uh, protein hormone. It's, it's a very gradual activity. But now we found out that they also have cell surface receptors. Some hormones, some cells. Not, it's not real common. Okay, this is actually from um, Silver Thorne's most recent well, not her most recent, her uh, third edition of Physiology. I think this is a wonderful picture. It's not in your book, I'm sorry. But um, anybody who wants to look at it can come up during the break and it'll be right here. This one is a homemade one. This has to do with the hormone response element, which is actually, a what are you laughing at? <laughs> the steroid hormone response element. And what a steroid hormone response element does is it allows the hormone receptor to bind to a spe specific gene and turn that gene on. So it, it, the, the sequence actually allows the receptor to bind to DNA in a particular place. This is called a hormone response element. This is DNA here. So this, this little stripey thing is the hormone response element. And this is sort of a, a classic picture of a steroid hormone receptor. Anybody know what these little legs are called? What, what happens is you have, you have the um, amino acids of the protein organized around a zinc. And these are called zinc fingers. And they bind to a particular DNA sequence, which is the hormone response element. So it's a specific sequence of DNA. And um, usually steroid receptors do not bind one receptor to the HRE. What <coughs> usually happens is the receptors have hormone binding sites, and when two steroid receptors of the same type are bound by the hormone, that activates their dimerization location <laughs> and they actually join to each other and they bind to the HRE as a pair. So they usually bind as pairs as opposed to single receptors. And the reason they do that is this, this sequence of DNA bases is palindromic. What do I mean by palindromic? It goes front ways and back ways. It's sort of like, you know, did you know that dog spelled backwards is God? I'm a dog owner. That's why I say that. Uh, but, but in a palindrome, I'm trying to... Race car. Good job. Bob. Yeah, Bob. Bob is, is palindrome. <laughs> Th this is good, race car, good. <coughs> okay, so it, it, what that means is the letters of the DNA, usually what happens is you'll have ATA and then intervening sequences, it doesn't matter what it is, and then you'll have ACA, and then uh, the sequences will go backwards. So it'll, it'll be I do not know of an HRE that is not palindromic. There's even a CRE, which is, is a, a sickle KMP response element binding protein response element. So it's, it's CRE is sickle KMP response element, but what happens is the sickle KMP in the cytoplasm activates a protein that goes into the nucleus and binds to the CRE, but they're always palindromic. Don't know why. So you've got this palindromic HRE 
that binds to the steroid receptors in pairs. I do not expect you to elucidate this in detail. Because I don't think the book even talks about this very much. Anybody read that chapter yet? Who's read the hormone chapter? <gasps> Guys, you got to keep up with the reading. Some people find it easier to do the lecture if they've already read the reading. Other people find it easier to read the reading after they've heard the lecture. But I would keep up with the reading if you can. Okay, now we know that, that steroid hormones are lipid soluble and we know that they are hydrophobic. So how do they travel in the aqueous plasma of the blood? Anybody want to guess? Say again. But no, they're not in vesicles, but that's a good guess. How, how do they travel? Binding protein. Yeah, proteins. Proteins are hydrophilic usually. They usually have polar pieces on them. So what happens is the steroid is picked up by a protein, a binding protein, and usually the way it works is the, the steroids are in the center and the binding proteins are, on, uh, are associated with them, but more up to the surface. All slippery proteins, or slippery hormones like steroids and thyroxin have binding proteins. A few protein hormones also do. So binding proteins are for all steroids, but also you will see binding proteins for a couple of protein hormones like growth hormone and IGF will, will be bound by binding proteins. And what I mean by a binding protein is the protein acts like a carrier or a, an, I'm trying to think of an example, a, a, a escort, I guess, an escort through the blood. So here we have the carrier protein. As the concentration of the hormone increases in the blood, you have hormone binding to this binding protein and it carries it through the blood. When you have a, a lower concentration of the hormone in the cell, then the hormone will actually leave the protein carrier and enter the cell. And this is an example of steroids because it's going into the cell r right through the membrane and into the nucleus. If you have a very high concentration of the hormone, the carriers can actually act as kind of a, of a holding tank for hormone. So let's talk about that a little bit. So functions of binding proteins. The function of the binding proteins here, one is to stabilize the hormone levels. And one way it does that is that when the hormone is bound to the carrier, it's inactive. Is usually in <coughs> when bound. That's important. So it can regulate the amount of active hormone. Also, uh, the binding protein can act as a tank for the hormone. The binding protein can provide, it provides um, equitable, if you, if you will, or equal delivery 
of hormone to tissues. Example, let's say I had two plates of cookies. What shall we make them? Chocolate chip? That's a favorite for most people. And I give one plate to Mike and one plate to David, and I say, take as many as you want and pass the plates back. And everybody who gets the plate, take as many cookies as you want. You think you guys in the cheap seats will get any cookies at all? No. So the front part will probably get two, maybe even three cookies apiece. You guys in the back, sorry. But what the, the binding protein does is it hangs on to the hormone so that the tissues downstream will get some hormone. So here we have hormone being made in great amounts. And down, this, is, this is through the bloodstream. This is downstream. You will still be getting enough hormone for effect because the binding protein will then hang on to it until it gets to the tissues that haven't seen much hormone. And that's because what I showed you before, the hormone will stay bound to the carrier protein until the concentration inside the cell is so low that it gets pulled off. It, it, there's a kind of a kinetics downhill when there's a low concentration in the cell. So if the cell is at the start up here where the hormone is being made and is already saturated with the hormone, it's not going to pull any more off the carrier. The carrier will take it further down. And that's one reason that growth hormone and IGF have binding proteins is so that cells remote from the place where they're being secreted will be able to get some of the hormone because growth hormone and IGF are important to all the cells. So it allows for uniform distribution to the tissues. So the first cell is exposed to the hormone downstream from the secretion of it are not going to be over exposed and the cells further away will get enough to be exposed. Okay, so what we've talked about is, is production of hormones, both peptides and steroids. We've talked about action of hormones, both peptides and steroids. We've talked about binding proteins. What happens when we don't want to have that hormone around anymore? How do we get rid of it? This is 11.7. It's actually in your book. And it's a degradation thing. Hormones, once we're done with it, or even if we're not done with it, will be metabolized. Sometimes a hormone will be activated by the metabolism and then allowed to have an action on the target cell. Sometimes the hormone will catalyze formation of an active form of the hormone, which will then allow action on the target cell. Sometimes it'll slip through without any kind of change, but a lot of hormone never even sees a receptor. Because what happens is it gets inactivated by our metabolism. It, it might be torn apart by the metabolism. The pieces or the entire hormone may actually be excreted. And in fact, um, I don't know if they still do it. They used to do urinalysis for pregnancy. I think they do blood tests now. But what they do, they look for estrone, the hormone estrone in the woman's urine because that is made in pregnancy. And it gets excreted, a lot of it. So it comes out in the kidneys. Pardon me? They do both now? Why? I don't know. Sometimes uh, I know that they pick up on protein and glucose in the urine. Uh, right, so if they're doing, they're looking for fetal deformities or anything like that, yeah. Okay. So, oh, maybe I should talk about this first. I haven't talked a whole lot about functions of hormones, but it's really hard to talk about 
functions, hormone functions in a general sort of way. One general thing is they tend to be sustained messages. Remember, the uh, nervous system does very specific and targeted messages. So the functions of hormones is for sustained messages, that is things that continue, and also for general messages. For instance, you call up your friend on the phone, you're talking just to your friend. That is, a, assuming nobody's t tapping the wires, that that's a general, um, and that's a specific message. But you stand out here on Sproul Plaza and start ranting and raving, and anybody walking by can hear it, that's a more general message. So hormones are more general, and nervous system messages are much more specific. Um, so let's talk about some of the sorts of things that individual hormones do. There are hormones that are what we call trophic. And trophic means nourishing. So they actually cause the tissues that they affect to to grow and flourish and, and thrive. Muscle contractions, some muscle contractions, usually smooth and heart muscle tissue contractions. They don't necessarily cause the contractions, but they may modulate the contractions. Um, Hormones can stimulate other secretions. So they can be um, inclined to make other glands secrete. They can change membranes. Hormones can change membranes. change transport functions and mediate transport, that sort of thing. They can regulate metabolism. They can uh, change blood composition. They can actually um, direct development as well as growth. <coughs> and they can actually change our behavior. So Hormones can have all kinds of different functions. Not all hormones have all of these functions, but they can make a big impact. Okay, now I'll can, I can show you this. When you say behavior, what do you mean? Oh, example of behavior. Um, risk taking, for instance. It has been found statistically that a much higher proportion of individuals who die by accident are young males. And that is caused by the hormone testosterone, which can also increase aggression. Um, I used to work with an endocrinologist upstairs in this building, actually, Dr. Nickel. He no longer teaches. He's retired. And um, he used to say that testosterone inhibited neural development. And he's right. Because if you look at, at a boy fetus and a girl fetus, the girl fetus is more neurally developed. And it is true that testosterone just slows neural development. It's, it slows the development of judgment. And you're more likely to find a 25-year-old man doing something really stupid with a car than a 25-year-old woman. 
And it has nothing to do with who's smarter. It's just testosterone increases risk-taking behavior. Does that answer your question, David? Kind of? Very much so. Okay, another one. Oxytocin, the so-called cuddle hormone, <laughs> causes women who have just given birth to be incredibly sickening and do a lot of coochie coo <laughs> and, and everybody else is going, whoa, brother, this woman has a PhD in nuclear medicine and look what she's doing now. And, and it, re it really does cause a change in your behavior so that you're more likely to not stash your screaming child in the garage, but, but you know, oh, poor thing crying, and everybody else is going, eee, shut it up, and oh, little one. And um, it, it can cause all kinds of changes in behavior. Also, if you cuddle with your special someone, that will make that special someone feel more attached to you just as it will make you feel more attached to the special someone. So love is actually <laughs> helped along by oxytocin, the cuddle hormone. So th those are a couple of examples. There's a big uh, article in Time about that. In Time? Yeah, no, uh, Nat National uh, Ge Geographic. National Geographic about oxytocin? oxytocin? And love, yeah. Yeah. Interestingly, oxytocin is made by birds, too. <laughs> and we don't think of birds as <coughs> Cuddlers, but in, uh, I saw a hand up here. Oh, was it you, dear? I was, talking, I was wondering about serotonin. <gasps> serotonin actually can influence your alertness. Yeah. yeah. And then you talked about uh, aggression too, or something about children that have more ser higher serotonin levels or more violent in kindergarten. That really surprises me, actually. But um, I'd be interested in seeing that article. Okay. So, yeah, serotonin. Uh, the, Serotonin levels can make you sleepy. Different serotonin levels can either make you sleepy or they can make you crazy. So, yeah. Yes, sir. If you prevent the, the actual hormone receptors for oxytocin in certain animal species are actually most, they won't fall, they won't pair a couple anymore. So but if you- they found in animals that animals don't fall in love, they just pair a couple. And oxytocin if, if, leaves if, that. If you completely knock out oxytocin secretions or oxytocin uh, receptor binding, mm -hmm. you will not have animals falling in love. Did you all hear that in the back? <laughs> he's, he's saying that animals need to have oxytocin to form pair bonds, even the temporary pair bonds for the process of making more babies. For monogamous relationships. Polygamous doesn't really matter. Yeah. But there are a lot of monogamous <laughs> animals out there. The, the vole? Yeah, the prairie vole is known to be the most monogamous creature. Really? I didn't know that. Who knew it? A little rodent. After yeah. one mating, they become like partners. Not due to vessel Gee, Too bad that doesn't work with humans, huh? <laughs> 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 if you inject a guy with vasopressin, like... <laughs> she said if you inject your guy with vasopressin. <laughs> Actually, if you inject him with vasopressin, he'll also retain water. <laughs> Actually yes, yes. Parrots. Parrots will cuddle, yes. That's a bird that cuddles. Birds of prey, not so much. Don't try to cuddle your, your falcon because you end up with little sores all over. And don't try to kiss your kestrel. It's a little bird of prey, even though it's the same size as a, a, a cockatiel, because you will end up with lots of wounds all over your face. They don't want to be touched. They don't even touch each other that much. Okay, boy, did we bird walk. All right, so anyway, this is a negative feedback loop. And as you can see, there are two kinds. There's the long and the short kind of feedback loop. <coughs> and the short feedback loop is between an anterior pituitary hormone secretion upon the hypothalamus. So when you make an anterior pituitary hormone and it travels through the, up the body through the blood because it's general and the hypothalamus cells that secreted the stimulating hormone that got the pituitary to make that hormone in the first place, it will feed back on the hypothalamus and stop that, the synthesis of that first hormone. That is a short loop feedback now when you have 
not all hormones have the long loop feedback, but when you have a hormone that is stimulated by, first of all, the hypothalamus making a, a trophic hormone that stimulates the pituitary to make a second hormone, that stimulates the endocrine gland to make a third hormone, and the third hormone feeds back not only on the pituitary but also on the hypothalamus, then you have what's called long loop feedback. I just showed you an example, a specific example. Does anybody remember what that was? What was the organ? Hint, it made steroids. The adrenal glands making cortisol. Cortisol feeds back on the anterior pituitary to reduce the amount of ACTH being made and also on the hypothalamus to reduce the amount of CRH being made. And that's a long negative feedback loop as opposed to the short, which is between the pituitary and the hypothalamus. And the reason I spent time with that is because people sometimes get confused. <laughs> Gesundheit get confused about that. Oh, gosh, this takes too long. What more do I have to do? I'm thinking you guys need to put your binders on the floor and keep a pen handy. We're going to have a little practice in answering questions is so easy. In fact, tell, tell them what you just told me. It should only take about two, three minutes. If you take longer than that, you're just really worrying yourself sick. Don't be over anxious. It's not meant to trip you up. It's meant to help you keep up, up with what we're doing. So, you have very neat printing. Really? Yeah. Okay, yes ma'am. Yeah. You too? Could you two talk after class? Okay, so Scott, and your name is? Victoria and Scott have a conversation about this because I don't know anything about it. Yes, dear. Have, um, do you have access to a space account? You know, they tell me I do. It's but very easy to make. I know, but I don't even have email here yet. They haven't even set me up with email yet. I just, a few minutes ago, got an exam room for my other class. I mean, it's just, it's been kind of slow. But yes, vSpace would be a really good thing. It would be really great. Everyone in this class would be registered to chat. And right. I'm sure there would And I can send emails to all of you. And there would be enough bandwidth. I wouldn't send you spam, though. <laughs> just things like, be sure to remember to bring mm, tomorrow, you know, that sort of thing. Okay, so does everybody have this down who wants to copy it down? I just wanted to show you some important places where hormones are made. We're going to be going, we're going to be moving north to the hypothesis, which is an old fashioned name for pituitary, right. And just to show you, this is the only picture I have that shows the pineal body. The pineal body is so called because when you look at the gland, it looks like an itty bitty pine cone. And the pineal body makes that one, I forget who brought it up, serotonin and, ah, and melatonin is made by the pineal body. Another interesting thing about the pineal body is it has retinoids in it. And it's thought that it was once a light sensitive organ. Some vertebrates have a light sensitive organ in the top of their head that can tell the day length and that changes the way hormones are secreted in those individuals. So the pineal body um, makes serotonin. You won't encounter that much in your text. I don't think it mentions it much. Let's talk about the hypothesis or also known as pituitary. You know, it used to be at the turn of the century, biologists thought the pituitary made spit. I think that's pretty interesting. It, it, they thought it made saliva. Aren't you glad that we didn't we don't live back then? So let's see, this went I forget where this one went. Stick it in here. Okay, so this shows you that the pituitary comes in two parts. 
It has an anterior lobe and a posterior lobe. And the anterior lobe is also called adenohypothesis. Does anybody know what adeno means? Gland, right. Did I spell that right? No, hypothesis is a gland, glandular portion of the hypothesis. And the posterior lobe was called the neuro hypothesis. And the reason for that is that the posterior lobe is really neural tissue. It's not glandular tissue. And what happens is cells, neural cells, that have their cell bodies in the brain, in the hypothalamus, make a couple of hormones. The hormones then travel down the axons of these neurons to the ends of the cells, and those cells are then able to give, secrete these neural hormones. Does anybody know what those two hormones are, just off the top of your head? Oxytocin is one of them, yes. ADH is the other one, vasopressin or ADH. Good, you guys know your hormones. And so it's really cool. If somebody said to you, which do you want to tell me about the posterior lobe or the anterior lobe, and you worry that you can't keep all of the hormones of the anterior lobe straight, just say posterior lobe, because there are only two that you need to worry about. And they're actually neural hormones because they're made, I should put that up, adeno hypothesis and neural hypothesis. They are actually made in neural tissue. And this shows you where the, hypo, the um, pituitary is in res respect to the hypothalamus of the brain. So let's talk a little more about that posterior lobe. This is, um, is this from Vander? No, I'm sorry, this is from Silverthorne. Um, and it shows how for the posterior lobe hormones, you've got a hormone that is made in the cell body of a neuron, which is actually in the hypothalamus. The vesicles containing that hormone transported down the cell, they're actually little fibers that the, the vesicles travel on to get to the end of the neuron, and the vesicles then gesundheit, exocytose into the interstitial fluid, which then allows the hormone to be picked up by the blood system. So there really are hormones that are released into the blood to influence tissue, a target tissue distant from the secreting cells, but because of the nature of the cell that makes the hormones, they're called neural hormones. Okay? Yes? Okay, you're right. The posterior lobe itself does not produce hormones. It secretes hormones. Right. And here's how it works. So this is from another... Can maybe I have one? No, I don't have a Vander picture that I like as well. So here is an example of something called a portal system. The portal... I should write that out. Portal. No, there it is. Portal system. What a portal system is a situation where you have two capillary beds between the outflow of the heart and the inflow of the heart. Usually what happens is you'll have the heart, you'll have arteries carrying the blood out to a capillary bed, and then from that capillary bed it'll go right out to the back to the heart. But in the case of a portal system, you have 
the outflow of the artery, then you have a capillary bed, then you have a second capillary bed, and then it goes to the heart, the zentai. There are not very many portal systems. In fact, you will learn about two portal systems in the human body, and this is one of them. The pituitary or, or hypophyseal portal system, and what happens is the hypothalamus has neuroendocrine cells in it that do not go to the posterior lobe. Instead, they drop their hormones in the first capillary bed. Now, if this capillary bed had to go back to the heart and go through the lungs and then go through the heart and come back to the anterior lobe, that would be a drag. It would take too long, first of all, and second of all, the hypothalamus cells would have to make far too much of the hormone. This way, it's dropped into just this tiny amount of blood in these vessels, in these capillaries, and it goes directly to the anterior lobe where a second capillary bed allows the diffusion of the hormones into the anterior lobe of the pituitary. So that way, these only have to make a little bit of their hormone it doesn't get diluted in the entire five plus liters of blood in the body. It just goes through the portal system into this next capillary bed. This is the reason for the hypothalamic anterior pituitary capillary portal system. It's very important for this portal system to exist so that these cells don't have to make so much hormone and secondly, you get a more immediate response. It's very quick, actually. Uh, and you do have a picture in your book. It's 11-12. Um, it's just I didn't think it showed it in enough detail, what was going on. So it does show the portal system. OK. 1114 in your book shows six classic anterior pituitary hormones and, and their effects. FSH and LH, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone were first discovered in females, which is why they have those names. But guys, you make FSH and LH also and they affect or gonads as well. So um, they show in this example that FSH and LH influence the production of sex hormones and sex cells, actually. And we will talk in much more detail about that when we talk about reproduction at the very end of this course. Growth hormone actually has not a whole lot of direct effects. It does influence the rate of protein synthesis and uh, metabolism, but its most important function actually is to act on various target tissues like the liver and the growth plate of bones to cause them to secrete insulin-like growth factor one, which is IGF-1. IGF-1 then has the effect of stimulating growth on those tissues. TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, causes the thyroid to make thyroxin, and thyroxin then influences metabolism. Prolactin is important for the development of milk in a lactating female. It also helps breasts grow in the female. In the male, it's Functions are still being investigated, and there is some, there are some data to suggest that male reproduction relies on prolactin as well. Doves and pigeons make prolactin in their pituitaries, and you see that it stimulates milk development in mammals. In birds, doves and pigeons, it causes the crop which is an organ that receives food, to make a product that people call crop milk. And what crop milk is made up of is very similar to what mammal milk is made up of. 
And the reason I'm telling you this is to show you the prolactin named because it was first discovered to have function in human lactation also functions in non-lactating beings. So doves and pigeons make crop milk. The, the bird, here's, this is a bird, believe it or not. The bird eats something and it goes into this holding tank which then will put food into the stomach. So this is the stomach, it's a terrible diagram, and this is the crop. And these birds, doves and, and pigeons, actually pigeons are doves, make a material in the crop to feed their baby birds and the material is mostly water and it contains protein and it contains calcium and other minerals. What do we know about mammal milk? What's it, what is it mostly? Water, yeah. It has a protein in it called casein. The protein in the pigeon crop milk is a different protein. It also has calcium. Oops, I forgot something. It has a sugar. In mammal milk, it's called lactose. In uh, pigeon milk, it's a different sugar, but it is a sugar nonetheless. So it's very interesting that prolactin stimulates a non-lactating animal to make a substance very much like milk. Kind of weird, actually, but I just thought I'd share that with you. Bird walking again. Um, ACTH, we've already talked about. It stimulates the adrenal cortex to make glucocorticoids like cortisol. Do I want you to memorize this? I'm not going to ask you to reproduce this, but I do think you should chat with your study buddy about this so you have a better memory for what they do. We will talk about some of these in much more detail down the road, like FSH and LH. Then you'll have to know the details. This is 1117. And this shows not only the hormones and their functions, but also what stimulates the hormones. And in each case, we've got the hypothalamus putting a hormone stimulator into the portal system to cause cells to make particular materials. So FSH and LH are made in response to the hypothalamus protein GnRH, which is gonadotropin-releasing hormone, because FSH and LH are also called gonadotropins. Uh, GHRH, growth hormone-releasing hormone, will actually stimulate the pituitary to make growth hormone. Somatostatin will actually inhibit the formation of growth hormone. The hypothalamus makes TRH, which causes the pituitary to make TSH to stimulate the thyroid. Dopamine has been found to have negative effects on prolactin. They have not yet found a positive stimulator of prolactin production although in pregnancy there are certain feedback loops that cause prolactin to increase. Um, CRH stimulates ACTH, as we said before. So this is a good one just to spend a little time with, but like I said, don't memorize every word. I'm not all about memorizing every word. I'm more about knowing enough to understand and explain. So the best question I can ask you is, why? Be able to answer the question, why? And the answer may not be in the book or the lecture. You might have to figure it out. Or you might have to predict what's going to happen if. OK, this is 1110 from your book. We're moving into a different kind of hormone. This is insulin. Fred Sanger spent his entire biology career sequencing insulin protein. A graduate student could sequence the DNA and then figure out the protein sequence of insulin in a day or two now. Fred Sanger became very famous for doing this, but this shows you how technology has changed. So this is one of those times when it's not a hormone 
that stimulates the hormone that we're looking at. It's something else. So insulin secreting cells are stimulated by increase in sugar in the blood. So we have increase in plasma glucose causes these cells to make more insulin. Where are these cells? The pancreas, and they're called the islets of Langerhand, and they are the what, beta or alpha? Beta cells. Plasma ins insulin increases, and then it says target cells. Who are insulin's target cells? Well, actually, the cells are just all over the body. Lots of cells have insulin receptors. So insulin receptors are important to, yeah, glucose, to let the cell bring in glucose. So um, insulin is stimulated not by another hormone, but by level of glucose. This is a really complicated slide. Just put your pens down. Take a deep breath. Hold it. Let it out. Okay, I don't expect you to memorize this. I'm just showing you a homeostatic balance. This is from Campbell, Campbell's biology. And this seesaw here is showing you how homeostasis is maintained through the action of not one, but two different hormones. So here we have the beta cells of the pancreas responding to high glucose levels, and they make insulin. So the insulin stimulates the body cells to take up more glucose and stimulates the liver to take up glucose and from the glucose synthesize glycogen and store the glycogen. Blood glucose level then goes lower, which then causes less insulin to be made because it's glucose levels in the blood that stimulates the insulin in the first place. And then you have a homeostatic um, balance. So rising blood glucose stimulates the pancreas. Lower blood glucose turns off the insulin secreting cells. But removing glucose from the blood, lowering the concentration of glucose <coughs> in the blood, actually stimulates the alpha cells of the pancreas to secrete another hormone called glucagon. Glucagon works via G protein receptor. And what it does is it stimulates the liver to make glucose to break down glycogen. It also stimulates fat cells to give up fat and turn that fat into fatty acids, which then can be converted by the liver into glucose. And that increases the level of blood in, or, or glucose in the blood, which then slows down the production of glucagon from the alpha cells. Do you see how we've got these two opposite action hormones responding to the opposite stimulus, and it provides a way for the body to keep a balance? I think they have Campbell in the library. I'm not sure. Here's a picture of insulin. I think this one might be in your book, but not this particular one. Um, insulin, remember we talked about pre-pro hormones last week? Insulin, in fact, let me get that piece of paper. It's not. Insulin is, is produced as a pro-hormone, and it's extruded as a single chain. And two of the chain, er, there are two disulfide bridges connecting two parts of that chain. Enzymes come along and chop off this piece of the original chain, and this is what insulin looks like. So now why does the body go to all the trouble of synthesizing this sequence of amino acids? Reduce the error? It's a placeholder, isn't it? It holds this section of insulin in place until <coughs> these disulfide bonds can be formed. Once those disulfide bonds are formed, then we have enzymes that chop these up. Do they get thrown away, those amino acids? Say again? They get reused. They get, they get chopped up into individual amino acids, which are then recycled and used to build other proteins. 
body does not waste. We need to recycle like the body. So anyway, pro-insulin and active finish insulin. And we already know the sequence because Fred Zanger sequenced it, but like I said, we should figure it out really quickly with a good, I'm not going to do this one, this is too confusing. Okay, so what happens on the cell is we have our insulin receptor and what happens is insulin binds to it and it then allows glucose to get into the cell. But there's something else interesting about insulin receptors. When insulin binds to an insulin receptor, the cell endocytoses the insulin-bound insulin receptor. So actually the insulin receptor is brought into the, back into the cell and it there will fuse with a lysosome which will separate the insulin from the receptor. And that's one way to keep the cells from constantly bringing in glucose. As soon as you have that receptor bound by insulin, it allows glucose in, then it too is endocytosed, or it is endocytosed and deactivated. So it's actually brought into the cell. Insulin works through transport or recruitment. You don't need to know those details. This next one we're going to talk about is the thyroid. This is 1120A. And this shows you where your thyroid is. In fact, you can, if you feel around, it's in front of your trachea. All I can feel is my trachea. Okay, it's down here. Okay, what it does is it makes thyroid hormone which is very important in metabolism regulation. Any baby born with, the, with not enough thyroid ends up having such damage in neural development that the child is retarded. Do you know the name of a child who doesn't have enough thyroid? Start, starts with a C. Cretan, yes. Not to be confused with folks from the Isle of Crete who are not Cretans. Okay, so um, thyroid tissue is complex. And a thyroid follicle, com it, it makes a, a precursor molecule called thyroglobulin. And the thyroglobulin then is uh, processed in the thyroid in such a way to make See if I have a picture of thyroid. I think I do. Yay! To make this greasy hormone, it's not a steroid. It's not a peptide hormone. It's based on this molecule here. Anybody remember what this is? What is this? This this structure? T Y tyrosine. tyrosine. So we have these tyrosine residues joined. And this is T4. This is T3. T3 has three iodines. T4 has four iodines. But what the thyroid does is it traps iodine very important to trap the iodine. Once it's tra trapped in the thyroid, it's very hard for the iodine to get out. And thyroglobulin is synthesized in the follicle cells, and the thyroglobulin is then, um, the tyrosine residues on it are iodinated. And two tyrosines joined make T4 or T3, uh, still attached to thyroglobulin, and then they are endocytose back into the follicle cell, and the thyroglobulin is cleaved off, 
and you will have T4 and T3 diffused into the blood. Ah, good. This is a picture from your book, I think. Yeah. This is 1121, and it shows what I just said, but in a lot more detail. Gesundheit. So you see, this is where the thyroglobulin is made, and then it is iodinated, and then they are endocytosed back into the cells that will then change them so that they can be secreted. And when they're secreted into the red blood or into the blood, what happens when they go into the blood? Can they just float around in the blood as they are with these these aromatic rings? How, do, how does the thyroxine get through the blood? How does it travel from the thyroid to the rest of the body? Binding proteins, right. So binding proteins are in the blood already. The thyroxine goes into the binding, into the blood, where it meets the binding proteins. The binding proteins make it possible for these greasy hormones to travel through the um, blood to various tissues. I'm trying to think of what else. Yes, sir? Is uh, T4 Yes, T3 is more, has a higher affinity for the thyroid receptors. And by the way, the thyroid receptors, interestingly enough, the thyroid receptors live in the nucleus. So this is the cell membrane, and this is the nuclear membrane. And here's your DNA, and here is your TRE, which is thyroxine response element and the thyroid being greasy the thyroid hormone can slip right through the lipids lipid bilayers and because the hormone is already on the TRE all the thyroxine has to do is bind to the hormone receptor and the hormone receptor then stimulates transcription Takes longer than one plans. Okay, so this is not from your book. This is from actually an old vander, a very old vander, showing what's happened, what the feedback loop and all. So you have the hypothalamus making TRH, the anterior pituitary makes TSH, the thyroid makes thyroid hormones, negative feedback, the hypothalamus makes less TRH. So the pituitary makes less TSH and there's less thyroid, so you have this balance. But in the case where you don't have enough iodine, you will have, there will not be enough thyroxine because there's not enough iodine. And what happens is the thyroid grows and it grows here and you end up with this big swollen part of the neck called a goiter. And I think your book has a picture of a goiter. I'm, they didn't, I don't think they gave me a copy of that. No, they didn't. They only give me overheads of the ones they want me to have. So the, um, there's a picture of a woman at the end of the section on thyroxine, and it shows her with a goiter. You don't see that so much anymore. It used to be a real problem in the Midwest because they didn't get a lot of iodine in their diet. On the coast, not a problem because salt, the sea salts contain iodine and they get into the air, the aerosolize in the air and our vegetables get iodine on them from the fog and the rain from the ocean. So we got plenty of iodine on the coast but in the Midwest not so much. 
And what did they do to fix that for the folks who were in the landlocked states? They put iodine in salt, right. You can buy it both ways now if you don't want too much iodine. So this, oh, that, that's very much like the one I just showed you. Forget that. Okay, here's another one. Ability of thyroid hormone, thyroid hormone to affect fatty acid catabolism from, from fats. Thyroid hormone alone does not cause fatty acid release from fats. Epinephrine can cause tiny amounts of fatty acid to be released, but when you have epinephrine and you have thyroid hormone together, you get huge amounts of fatty acid release. And this is something called synergy or augmentation. For some reason, it's written upside down there. I'm not sure why that is. But augmentation. And actually, in my own endocrine work, I found uh, a glucocorticoid that had no effect alone, but when there was insulin in the medium, the glucocorticoid and insulin together had an effect. So this is not an uncommon thing. Often you will find different hormones having a synergistic effect in their function. <coughs> the thyroids do more than just make thyroid gland, does more than just make thyroid hormone. It also makes something else called calcitonin, C-A-L-C-I-T-O-N-I-N. And what that does is it influences calcium levels in the blood. How much calcium is going to be deposited in the bone? It actually pulls calcium out of the blood and uses it to mineralize bone. Um, it reduces the amount of calcium your intestines absorb from food. It reduces the amount of calcium recycling in the kidneys. So it actually reduces the level of calcium. That's okay because you don't want too much calcium. But there are other glands. There are these little small glands that live attached to the thyroid gland called parathyroid gland. And the parathyroid gland secrete the imaginatively named parathyroid gland hormone, which we call PTH. And what PTH does is it stimulates calcium being taken away from bone. It increases the amount of calcium that's absorbed from dietary intake. It increases the calcium recycling by the kidneys, so it raises the calcium levels. Calcium homeostasis then is controlled by thyroid gland making calcitonin and the parathyroid gland making PTH. And I think our last slide for the day. Yay. Are you all seeing me? Will be um, from up oh, Silverthorn again, just showing a feedback reflex uh, from the parathyroid cell. You make parathyroid hormone increases the uh, amount of calcium in the plasma through these various aspects and then feeds back on the parathyroid cell so it makes less parathyroid hormone. Okay, how are you guys doing? You sleep yet? Okay, go home. Don't forget, keep studying. Keep up with the reading and, and go redo your notes tonight.